so Christopher, we often wonder what the motivation is for self-portraits. Yes. And there are some artists who, uh, like Rembrandt, make plenty of them. Yeah. But what was uh, a troubled soul like Ruskin's motivation for making a self-portrait? Well, you know, the immediate um, prompt for doing the self-portrait was the friendship with this American, Charles Eliot Norton, who was disturbed, who was really worried about Ruskin. And in the 1870s, Ruskin was cracking up. Mm. Um, he, there was this pattern of bipolarity you know, after really energetic periods of work on writing projects, he'd sink back into despondency and become introspective and, and depressed. Um, and Norton believed that you know, Ruskin could find himself by searching into his own physiognomy, by studying his own appearance, um, and that this would be a way of self-identifying, as it were. Um, uh, whether it worked or not, I mean, there are a series of these self-portrait drawings, of which this from New York, from Morgan Library, is the most extraordinarily intense. Um, and it's all about looking, isn't it? I mean, you know, his eyes are absolutely piercingly engaged with their reflected image, as if he really is trying to discover something about himself. He's a Victorian in the sense that he certainly is not going to be tempted to reveal information about his inner desires and feelings. For that, mm -hmm. we look at the drawings. Right. I mean, this is, Mark, this is what this exhibition is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, from the very outset, our purpose has been to put together a group of drawings which give you glimpses of the man. And the drawings really are incredibly revealing because he's utterly ingenuous in his choice of subjects, you know, the landscapes, the geological studies, the architectural stu subjects. Um, there's, no, there's no monitoring, there's no self-control. The, the drawings follow absolutely the pattern of his obsessions and preoccupations. No, it's so interesting the way we've managed to put together, uh, well, the Basilica of St. Mark's against its daguerreotype, for example, well, why don't we look at that? Yeah. Because that's a building that many, many people are familiar with, yeah. perhaps more than, than the Pisan church over here. And that watercolor, that drawing is an amazing tour de force. Isn't it? It's a relatively complete formal study, but it has within it um, such myriad variations, particularly, I think, in the observation of these capitals, these Byzantine capitals that mm -hmm. um, support the southwest portico. Ruskin loved them because they were all different. Each one, most of them brought from Constantinople after the sack of Constantinople by the Venetians in 1204 at the conclusion of the Fourth Crusade. Um, and each one redolent with historical associations, each one different to the next. But it's also a monument to imperialism, isn't it? Because these are all made by different hands and from different places. Yeah, and it's the different hands. It, you know, he has this sense of the identity of craftsmen whose lives had been led you know, millennia, a millennium previously. Uh, Who'd never uh, heard of Venice. Who'd uh, never heard of Venice, and yet this is their memorial, their mm. unwitting memorial. And we called the exhibition Artist and Observer, and mm -hmm. it's deliberately, you know, it's a deliberate duality, because he really was an artist. He may not have been a professional artist. He wasn't trying to make drawings which he could sell. Mm -hmm. He wasn't receiving commissions. He wasn't looking to have his drawings exhibited, except on rare occasions. But he was an artist. Well, I see him more as an observer, because uh, artists are categorized through style. Yeah. And there is uh, very little style in this yeah. work. He's very he careful about describing this thing quite precisely and not having any interference yeah. from his own imagination or, or style. Is that true? Or there, are, there are different objectives operating simultaneously. And because it wasn't a professional artist, mm -hmm. he did what he needed to do on any occasion. He wasn't simply um, creating a consistent artistic product. So um, the point is not the drawing, it's the observation, absolutely. it's the process. Yeah. <laughs> These are just studies and sketches. Mm -hmm. But studies and sketches, was, that was all he needed to do. When you look at a drawing like, for example, this, um, this study of the Cardoro in Venice, well, per, um, half the sheet is, is just unfinished. But it wasn't worth his time. Right. He, he got what two, he wanted out of the process. 
yeah, he had too great a sense of urgency to spend another few days or another, anyway, many hours completing the composition to make it into a coherent, exhibitable composition. Um, no, this is about information. Right. Ruskin writes The Stones of Venice. Yes. He makes some glorious drawings of the stone uh, architecture in Venice. And yeah. then he has this great uh, period of obsession with geology. Yeah. What is it about Ruskin and well, rocks? You know, when, Mark, when he, um, when he wrote The Stones of Venice and was inspired by everything he saw in Venice, he'd said if he hadn't discovered Tintoretto, Tintoret, he wouldn't have written The Stones of Venice. He would have written The Stones of Chamonix. Oh. Because, you know, geology and the physical world was his other obsessive interest, his lifelong passion. Um, and he makes these fantastic studies, which, of course, are absolutely informed by his knowledge of how the landscapes form. This watercolour of the Scottish Highlands, cross mount, showing these glaciated rock surfaces, granite, which has been ground smooth by the action of ancient um, glaciers, and then undercut by um, a freeze-thaw mechanism. And then even the, the foliage, the vegetation, is swept by the wind, so it's all blended together into an integral whole. As he becomes ever more neurotic and ever more isolated, um, there's a divergence between two principal forms of draftsmanship. On the one hand, one sees studies which are done at considerable speed and which seem to have a kind of ecstatic quality. Here's an example. It's it's quite a slight sketch, but it's intensely coloured and very beautiful. Um, an evocation of the effect of sunset on the Venetian lagoon, close to the cemetery island of San Michele with Murano in the distance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he did it in a spirit of delight. You know, he was just thrilled by the meteorological effect that he found that winter's afternoon um, from his gondola in Venice. And he enjoyed it so much that he suffered a relapse. And he says in his diary that he really comes to the conclusion that he'd felt the beauty of the place so intensely on that occasion that he was suffering the consequences. It damaged him. It damaged him. Towards the end of that stay, he makes this extraordinary watercolor of the northwest corner of the facade of the Basilica of St. Mark's in Venice. His immediate um, prompt for drawing this, making this study of the Basilica is because there was a rumored plan to reconstruct the facade of the Basilica, if you can believe it. Oh, An dear. architect called Giambattista Meduna had put forward um, a, a plan to the Ven Venetian authorities to take down all the columns and the capitals, to eliminate the remaining um, 13th century mosaics, to, to build it in an orderly fashion, to make it you know, an ornament to a modern city. And Ruskin was just so appalled at the thought that anybody could want to do that, um, that he lent his name to a campaign, international campaign, which was launched, um, William Morris was involved to try and prevent that happening, prevented that happening. And Ruskin devotes himself to this study of a building that he adored, that he'd looked at for decades. In a similar situation as the Cadoro yeah, earlier. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a gesture of protest. Mm -hmm. You know, we must preserve this because it's so important. Mm. Um, it's drawings of this kind that we can regard as symptoms of this um, sense of helplessness, of wanting to make something of which you could be certain. Thank you so much for enriching this for us, Christopher. Mark, it's such a pleasure, and uh, gosh, I've loved seeing the things again, seeing them with you, and you know, working on the exhibition. It's just been well, a it's delight. Been, it's been thrilling for us. Thank you Thank again. Thank you. Thank you so much.